Um, so the first type of downsampling operation that we will talk about is known as max pooling. Um, so it's actually a very simple operation. Um, for example, if I have these four by four input image or input feature map, I will divide them into two by two squares. Okay, so here I have uh, differentiated them by color. There is the red portion, the green portion, the yellow, and the blue portion. And from each of the two by two portions, I will take the maximum value. For example, the maximum value in the two by two red area is number six. And I will copy that number to my output here. And similarly, uh, for the green area, I will identify the maximum and copy it over. And uh, here is the maximum is three. Here the maximum is four. So this is known as the max pooling operation. Um, and you could have variations, but this is known as max pooling with two by two filters and the stride equal to two, right? So two by two filters, meaning I'm taking the two by two area at a time and stride equal to two means that I'm going to move to a new location um, by, so I'm gonna move two pixels at a time so that these areas do not overlap. It's possible to have other settings, um, although the typical setup, I think, is for the filter size and the stripe to be equal. But obviously, you could do uh, other settings as well. Um, an alternative to max pooling is mean pooling. Um, it's basically the same idea. I'm going to divide uh, the input area into a number of our input matrix into a number of areas and will take the average uh, within each area. So I can take the average of these four values and take transfer that um, or take that value as my output for this mean pooling operation. Okay, once again, uh, this is a two by two filter and a stride two. I could do three by three filter and stride three or even stride two uh, although in my experience, the number, uh, the future size and the stride are typically equal. Um, another way to do downsampling is to make the stride greater than one. So remember stride is the number of pixels we move at any one time. So if I move by more pixels, obviously my output will become smaller and that is a downsampling effect, right? So uh, in the equation, stride appears on the denominator. So obviously increasing stride has the effect of reducing the output feature map. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the activation function. Um, for example, we could have uh, the ReLU activation function. We talked about the sigmoid activation function we talked about the hyperbolic tangent operation, all right? Um, but uh, these operations have one issue, which is that um, the maximum derivative at any point are always less than one. And sometimes they're considerably less than one, only about, for sigmoid, I think the maximum is here, the maximum is here, and it's only like, uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 or something like that. And that kind of creates a problem when we have multiple layers and um, when we uh, do gradient descent, um, the the loss, when you do backpropagation, um, the gradient can become quite small for the first few layers and optimization becomes difficult. And we will talk about these issues in our le next lecture. Uh, but just I want just just wanted to give you a bit of foreshadowing. Um, so alternative uh, activation function is known as ReLU or uh, linear rectifier uh, rectifier linear unit, which is, if you ask me, quite a weird name but I, I think they wanted to, to have a acronym which they can pronounce. So it's called the ReLU activation function. And it's a very simple function. In, um, the, 
uh, the the uh, for, if for an input that is greater than zero, uh, the function will be the identity function. Okay, so uh, y will be equal to x if x is greater than zero. And y, the output will be zero if the input is less than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is basically uh, the diagram we have here is the uh, function of the form of the function. Okay, and this is the uh, mathematical equation. Um, so there are some benefits, right? First of all, it is not a linear function. Um, as we've seen, if you have two, uh, we have linear functions between adjacent uh, matrices, um, the two matrices would merge into a single matrix and the expressive power does not increase. So often you do want to introduce some nonlinearity in your function. Um, so so that's that's one thing. It's it's like piecewise linear. That means like in a particular interval, um, the function is linear. In this interval, it's in the interval below zero, it is linear. In the interval above zero, it is linear. But overall, this is a nonlinear function. Okay. Um, so number two, it creates sparse activation and uh, many uh, pushes all the negative elements toward zero and sparsity sometimes is an effective regularization. And when uh, the input is greater than zero, uh, it gives you pretty good gradient, right? So the gradient is one and that uh, kind of alleviates some of the optimization problems that we will talk about in our next lecture. Um, so a problem with ReLU is that sometimes um, when, you, when you do some gradient descent and you drive your input value to a value that is below zero, um, that unit sometimes would not be able to recover from that position because uh, here we the gradient is zero. So the output of uh, the output would not receive any gradient and uh, it would be difficult to pull it back uh, from this area back to this area. right? Uh, so so what do we do? Um, some people have produced variations of ReLU, such as leaky ReLU or parametric ReLU. Okay, so uh, the leaky ReLU gives you like a tiny, tiny value uh, for your gradient. So y is equal to 0 0.0x when x is less than zero. So uh, the gradient uh, of y with respect to x obviously is 0 0.01. And that means that you could still uh, have a non-zero gradient and you could maybe help yourself uh, and pull yourself back from the uh, below zero region um, and uh, uh, go back to the positive territory. Um, and the parametric ReLU is a similar idea. That is that we're gonna give a positive number to, uh, to Z uh, when z is less than zero, uh, so that it's possible to put yourself up. And this a will be a parameter that you can learn uh, together with gradient descent. So this is known as parametric ReLU. And, um, uh, you know, it's very easy to do these things with PyTorch, uh, which provides you with a lot of different activation functions, uh, such as leaky ReLU and allows you, it actually allows you to set uh, the negative slope. So it doesn't have to be exactly 0 0.01, but value you like, right? So another really popular uh, activation function these days is known as GLU, and it's often used in the transformer network. And the uh, actual function form, the analytical form of this function is actually a little complicated. So I'm not going to show you here, um, I think it's important to gain like a intuitive understanding of what this function looks like. So this is the zero point of my input. So 
when the input goes below zero, the output temp uh, goes below zero as well for a very short amount of uh, of length, and for for a short period, then it goes back uh, and then goes to zero and stays there. Okay, so this is uh, the glue function, and um, why would this glue function be better than the redo function? Now, my personal interpretation is that um, in glue, once you go below zero, sometimes it cannot really recover. But glue, if you go down below zero, just for a little bit, not by too much, you still get a non-negative gradient for you to put yourself back to the positive territory. Uh, but if you keep moving, you can actually go to zero if you want to. Right, so it gives you that flexibility, um, and uh, it sort of gives you the second chance uh, before you go into that zero gradient uh, region. So that's my personal interpretation. Um, okay, so the next uh, thing that we will talk about is normalization. Okay, so. Uh, the normalizing the input is actually a very common practice in machine learning, okay? So, and we do this in deep learning as well. And for example, if we're dealing with image input, what we typically do is to normalize the input images by channel. So that uh, statistically on average or in expectation, the each channel would have zero mean and unit standard deviation. So the standard deviation is one. Okay, so why is that useful? Um, one way to think about that is that it kind of balances the contribution of each input dimension or maybe each input channel when you have this natural um, channel behavior in your input or grouping uh, in your input. And um, the another reason is that this can, uh, and, and kind of an implication of that, I should say, is that this could improve training. Um, so this, I'm gonna give you some very intuitive explanations here. And when we talk about optimization, I will give you a more detailed explanation there. Okay, so there will be more mathematical uh, justification when we talk about um, optimization. So we're going to consider a very simple model where y is simply uh, the dot product between the beta vector and the x vector. So it's beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2. And um, if beta 1 and beta 2 are of similar magnitudes and x1 is way, way smaller than x2, then uh, beta 2 x2 will be the dominant factor. Or maybe I should say x1 is also greater than zero. And then beta 2 x2 will be the dominant factor. Okay, so uh, if then, then you know, uh, it, the output will basically ignore the contribution of x1. Okay, uh, to compensate, we could compensate by setting beta 1 to be way greater than beta 2. And that means uh, beta 1, x1, and beta 2, x2 will have similar magnitudes, and no one will really dominate the other, and the model is sensitive to the information contained in both input dimensions. But then this could lead to some optimi optimization difficulties where beta 1 and beta 2 would require really different learning rates. Because if I add, since beta 1 is way greater than beta 2, if I add the same value to beta 1 and beta 2, beta 1 will barely change, where beta 2 could change a lot. So that would make beta 2 really unstable and make beta 1 difficult to optimize because beta 1 does not move in this type of updates. So then you have to basically set different learning rates. Maybe you want to give beta 1 a large learning rate and beta 2 is small learning rate to uh, efficiently optimize them. But then that is a manual hyperparameter setup that's kind of difficult to tune. 
Okay, so this uh, like value differences or scale differences between input values can actually create um, some optimization difficulties. So uh, the common way to think, the common thing to do is to apply some normalization so the input channels become of comparable values, um, then things get better, right? So the way to do that is first that I am going to compute the channel-wide uh, mean across the entire data set, okay? So for all the images in uh, my data set, uh, in my training set, I will take all their values in the red channel and I will find their average. So that's my mu r. And I'll do the same for mu g and mu b. Uh, and I also want to find their standard deviations. These are sigma r, sigma g, and sigma b, right? And for a particular input, uh, x, I can treat this as a matrix. And each um, channel becomes a vector. And I will subtract. Uh, the mean value from each of the pixels. So this is, you know, uh, not rigorous math because I am subtracting a scalar from a vector, but you can just understand this as a bit of a broadcasting in Python operation um, that I am subtracting the same mu from all the pixels in the red channel and so on and I'm subtracting mu g from all the pixels in the green channel and so on. And I will also divide all the green uh, red pixels by sigma r and the, I'll divide all the green channel pixels by uh, sigma g. And then I will use this new uh, input x tilde uh, in place of the old input. So this is known as uh, a bit of input normalization or sometimes referred to as whitening. Right, uh, so uh, this actually helps uh, optimization, uh, and it's commonly used in machine learning uh, way before deep learning becomes mainstream. Uh, but the problem with deep learning is that we really have a lot of layers, right? And many of the internal layers, um, the, we don't have any normalization mechanisms for them. And sometimes it can be really difficult to optimize these layers because of that, okay? So uh, there are a number of optimization, sorry, normalization techniques proposed for deep networks and batch normalization is one of the most popular, okay? So um, batch normalization can be uh, understood in this diagram where um, n is the number of inputs in the same batch, okay? And we have channel C, and I'm putting the height and the width into, a same, uh, into the same dimension so I can draw this in in like a 3D cube, right? So basically I wanted to take one particular channel and, uh, and I wanted to aggregate all the values at all spatial locations, so at all H and W values, and I wanted to take all the uh, images uh, of the same batch. So I want to aggregate all these values and normalize them together so that they together have zero mean and unit standard deviation. Okay, so uh, that's basically what I'm trying to do. Remember the feature map size um, is B A times H times W times C. B is the batch size. Uh, so I should probably replace this with B. And C is the number of channels. Okay, so I'm going to take one channel. And for the rest, B times H times W elements, I wanted to compute a mean and average and a standard deviation and normalize these values using those two statistics. So that's the idea of binomial. Okay, so imagine I have a feature map size uh, a feature map, this is for a single data point, and that has um, these uh, channels, C channels. Um, I have already computed the batch-wide channel mean for this, uh, for any of these channels, and a standard deviation uh, for any of these channels. And uh, I have, you know, for channel I, I have mu I, and I have sigma I. And uh, 
I wanted to subtract mu i from the each value in the vector x i. And I will divide each value after the subtraction. I want to divide each value by uh, sigma i plus epsilon. Now you may ask, like, why shouldn't we just divide by sigma i, which seems to be the most uh, correct thing to do. Uh, but we wanted to add epsilon, uh, where epsilon is a small constant to increase numerical stability. Because um, these statistics are estimated from a small from a batch that sometimes is not very large. So the estimates may be a little bit off. Um, and if you happen to have a very small value uh, for sigma, if let's say your sigma is like 10 to the power of negative 10, uh, it's a very, very small value. And if you divide by this value, um, your, you know, even a small value will become, even a small value divided by this value, even 10 to negative four divided by this value will become 10 to the power of six, will become a huge value. Okay, so this leads to some numerical instability. Um, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not great for computers because, uh, you know, computers are not really uh, infinitely precise. They have finite precision and numerical stability is actually a very important consideration for these type of numerical algorithms. Um, so we do want to add epsilon um, to avoid dividing by zero or dividing by a very a number that's very close to zero. Dividing by zero is obviously bad, but dividing by a number that's close to zero um, is not nearly as it's not as bad, but it's also uh, pretty bad by itself. Okay. So that's why we wanted to add epsilon. Now, in addition to this normalization operations, uh, we are having we are having two parameters. Okay, this is a little interesting um, because after normalization, the if you think of the data values uh, as a distribution, the entire uh, distribution will always have zero mean and unit standard deviation. And that actually limits the expressive power of uh, the neural network. It limits the um, type of functions it can represent. And we don't want it to constrain it too much. So we give the network the possibility to learn to represent a large variety of representations by reintroducing two parameters, beta and gamma. So beta is basically the new mean after the normalization in gamma is the new standard deviation. So you could change these things, right? You could really maybe diminish the standard deviation or increase the standard deviation. Um, that's all learnable, right? And uh, we, for every uh, channel, we have one set of gamma and beta. Okay, and after that, we'll use the normalized uh, tilde values, x i tilde um, in place of the old values. So this is the batch norm operation. Um, so there is one caveat when you try to use batch normalization, that is you want the batch size to be reasonably large. Okay, you cannot have a batch size that is too small, like two or one, and that's gonna create a problem. And why is that? Um, when we talked about probability theory, we talked about the estimators for the mean and the standard deviation, okay? Uh, a detail that we, uh, I'm not sure if you paid attention to, but a detail there is that for the mean estimator, the variance of that is the variance of the original distribution divided by the number of data points participating in the mean operation. Okay, so that so that is to say, if you have a really small number of data points that are participating in the average, let's say you go on the street and you randomly stop three people and take their average height as the average height of the entire Singapore, um, there is a chance that you would get a number that's really off. If you happen to sample, let's say, 
a basketball player from the national team, then you could have somebody who's really tall and uh, he or her will significantly distort um, the value you compute because you have too few samples. And the same idea uh, applies here, right? If you have a very small number of pixel values participating in the mean calculation, the variance could be really large and the calculation could be really off. And that would really disrupt the uh, normalization operation, right? And similar conclusion holds for sigma, uh, whose variance is also related to the number of data points participating in the calculation. Okay. So what happens, um, uh, what happens uh, when we have, uh, Okay, so what happens during inference, right? So during inference, we uh, uh, um, so one question we may ask uh, is that why we use batch uh, wide statistics like the batch mean and the batch variance instead of the data set mean and the data set variance. Right, because um, it sounds like if you use data set mean and data set variance, we wouldn't have the requirement of a reasonably large batch. And the estimate of the channel wide mean and the channel wide variance would be pretty accurate. So why wouldn't we do that? And that is because typically we have a reason we have a fairly large data set, and to compute the data set wise statistics are very expensive. Okay, so during training, we're going to compute only the mean for the current batch and current standard deviation, right? And that is because, um, um, you know, if you want to compute data set mean, um, for the middle layers, um, the parameters are going to change. So as you train the network, the uh, data set mean and data set variance are also going to change. And you can compute data set by statistics once but very soon these values will change. So you have to calculate them again and over and over. Um, for the input, uh, the statistics don't change, right? So um, we can compute the red channel mean and the green channel and blue channel means for ones, and we can use them for eternity, as long as we keep the same data set. Uh, but for the uh, intermediate layers, since the weights below this layer change, the statistics will also change, and we have to recompute them from time to time. Okay, so uh, what about inference? Um, for during inference, we also, during training, we keep a running mean and a running variance um, that is aggregated uh, across all the batches uh, that we have seen during training. Um, so these are basically uh, just uh, exponential moving averages. Okay, so we have uh, the running mu as uh, this is kind of the old historical mu multiplying by alpha value, and where alpha is a value between zero and one. And I will update like a portion of the a, a one minus alpha fraction of that using my current batch, right? And the similar thing happens for the variance. So I have the running variance. And during inference, I will use the running mean and the running variance I have collected so far uh, to calculate uh, the normalization, okay? And, uh, this is this is quite nice because um, uh, the uh, gradient the the uh, gradient descent operation um, in the end uses pretty small learning rates, right? So a lot of layer weights are not supposed to change too much, and if you do the running mean, um, it's gonna actually be pretty close to the data set wise statistics. Okay, so in PyTorch. Um, we notice there is a behavior difference in training and in inference, and such changes is controlled by uh, 
these two functions, uh, model.eval and model.train, right? So if you call model.train, the behavior will change to uh, training behavior, which is to use the batch wide uh, mean and the standard deviation. Um, if you use, um, if you call the function model eval, it will change to inference mode and uh, they will use uh, this uh, batch norm operation. We will use the running mean and the running variance it has collected so far, okay? So don't uh, mistake this as uh, a control for auto differentiation. Uh, these two functions do not control if you compute the gradient or not. Okay, that is actually controlled by uh, torch no grad and torch inference mode. So you have to do both if you wanted to do inference and you say, I don't want to calculate gradient uh, whatsoever, right? So that could uh, save you some calculation. Um, during training, another thing to note is that during training, um, the mean values uh, actually participate in the gradient calculation. So you could uh, differentiate uh, through uh, the mean and the standard deviation values. And that that is something um, that people don't often talk about. Uh, why do we have uh, training and inference time differences? This is what I just said, but let me try to just make them more formal uh, by writing them down. Um, at training, the network parameters are being updated continuously um, that will change the data set statistics, okay? So uh, old values are not so reliable, so we want really want to use the new values of the current batch. At inference time, however, uh, we don't want to change the network parameters, okay? We want to fix everything. Even these uh, data set statistics should remain fixed because they're part of the operation, okay? So, and we wanted to you know, to be able to do inference on any input, even if it is a very small batch or it's a single image, you should be able to do inference on that, right? So you have to somehow get the statistics from somewhere uh, and fix them. And we use the running mean and the running var, running variance for that purpose, okay? Uh, so, so that's kind of the difference between the training time behavior and the inference behavior. And there are other types of normalization as well, um, such as uh, layer norm or instance norm or group norm. And uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, layer norm when we talk about transformer networks. Um, but basically uh, they just take different uh, groups of values and normal, um, normalize them together. I wouldn't get I wouldn't get into the details, but I will briefly describe uh, what's the basic idea. Uh, for instance, norm. Uh, basically, people in some cases do not want to have interference from other uh, images or other data points in the same batch. Right. This batch norm introduces some correlation or some crosstalk between different data points in the same image. And there are cases you don't want that. And instance norm basically takes the single training instance and a, and a single channel and normalize only within that set of pixels. Um, but that is a bit of a problem because maybe you have too few pixels and the uh, mean estimates and the uh, variance estimates are not so reliable. Um, so group norm says that we're going to group several channels together so that we have uh, more pixels, but these groups uh, are still within the same data point in the same image or the same feature map. Uh, so we still avoid the crosstalk between the images. Okay, so um, definitely if we, if we check those normalizations out, um, we wouldn't dive into too much detail in number course because you know, we, we have limited time and we cannot cover everything, okay? So that basically concludes our discussion on normalization and uh, we will switch to uh, skip connections after the break. <laughs>